I've entitled this morning's message, Ambassadors or God's Ambassador. God's Ambassador. Um, you will know, or maybe you won't, but over the last five weeks, we've been dealing with a series on practical community. You've heard a number of talks about what it means um, for us and how we can live practical community in our communities in a God-honoring way. Today is not going to be any different. Um, today is going to be a very practical message on how do we fulfill our role as ambassadors. How do we fulfill our role as ambassadors? And so the key scripture, which you've probably already guessed from Shanti's introduction this morning, is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 from verses 15 to 20. And that will come up on the screen. And... Um, let me read that for you. I'll just unpack it a bit as we read it. From verse 15. And he died for all. Obviously talking about Christ here. He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So we see that because he died for us, we no longer live for ourselves. We now live for him. Though we once regarded Christ, uh, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. We no longer look through the world and, and the things that happen in the world through carnal eyes, through physical eyes. We look at them with a new perspective, through spiritual eyes. Therefore, because of that, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone the new has come. That's exciting. We are a new creation. Because of what Christ has done for us, we are a new creation. The old has come, and the past is the past. We, there's, a, there's a declaration of change. All of this, all of this is from God. God did all of that. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, reconcili reconciliation means being restored in relationship with. So Christ did all of that so that we, us, could be restored in relationship with him. That was the purpose. And not only that, but he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting men's sin against them. He gave us that ministry to be able to, to share. And, and this is, this is the, the part that I want to focus on. He has committed to us. That's us sitting here this morning in this church. The message of reconciliation. He has committed to us the responsibility and the message of a restoring relationship with the world to him. We are therefore, because we have received this message of reconciliation, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. So as an ambassador, we are being used as vessels. God is, is making his appeal through us to, to the world. And we implore you on Christ's behalf. Other translations use stronger words here. I beg you. I beseech you. There's an urgency. I implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. Now, he's not talking about salvation. Salvation is already assumed in the previous passages. It's because we are saved that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. It's because we're saved that we've been given the, the responsibility to be ambassadors for him. And so he's urging us, because of that responsibility, to make right with God, to restore our relationships with God, to live our lives in such a way that we would, we would honor the responsibility that God has given us to be ambassadors. And you saw a, a little bit of a definition this morning of what that means to be an ambassador for anything. So, if we are ambassadors, let me just unpack that word ambassador a little bit more. You've got a beautiful illustration this morning. But what does it mean to be an ambas ambassador? So I looked it up in the dictionary. An ambassador 
is a diplomatic official of the highest rank sent by one sovereign state to another as its resident representative. So, it's a very important person, a person of high office or high rank who is part of one country, one state, one kingdom, one sovereignty, okay? And he is transplanted into another to represent what this kingdom, this sovereignty, this um, country is all about. That's what it means. So in our role as Christians, that means that God has not only just taken us as mere little Christians, he has, he has esteemed an honor upon us, a responsibility on us to be, to be high-ranking officials in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of light. We have, we have a huge responsibility, and we have been placed in this world. The Bible says we're, we're in the world, but we're not of this world. We have been placed in this world to bear testimony of what it's like to live in the kingdom of God. That's what it means. So, so that's, quite an, uh, that's quite a responsibility, isn't it? It's quite a responsibility. I, I want to tell you a little, bit, little story this morning. I have uh, some family members. Um, most of you have unsaved family members that you've been praying for over the years. And we have a number that we've been praying for and ministering to and looking for opportunities for them to come to know Christ. And um, about four or five years ago, this particular um, couple, a very close family, um, committed their lives to the Lord. And we were overjoyed. We were excited. And um, they started going to church. They got involved. We met with them. We encouraged them in their faith. And um, we said to them, get plugged in in the local church, find a home group, get involved, start doing stuff. You can't live Christian as a Christian on your own. And they did. They, they were having home cells in their home. And they were really getting on with the Lord. And then um, something happened. And it derailed a little bit. And they, they slowly stopped having the home cell in their house. And then they stopped going to home cell. They stopped going to church. And their Christian walk just kind of, they backslid horribly. And, um, and we just continue to love them and continue to pray for them. I never pried. I never wanted, never wanted to push any buttons. And um, anyway, about two months ago, um, we were on our way down to Durban. We were going to be having a bride with this couple. And, um, and we arrived there right in the middle of a Barney. <laughs> they had just had a family fight. And she had got in the car and she had pushed off. And um, and so he was there on his own, and we were supposed to be having a bra. So him and I were standing around the fire, and we were, and we were talking, and I was just trying to encourage him. And, um, and I said to him, what happened? You used to go to church. You used to, you used to be involved. You don't anymore. You, you can't live your life on your own. And I'm trying to encourage him back into fellowship and into faith. Um, and he said to me, Jeff... I'll never go to church again. I said to him, why? He said, because they're a bunch of hypocrites. He said, they're a bunch of hypocrites. He said, they live, they, on a Sunday morning, they're all there clapping hands and doing all this stuff. He said, but during the week, he says, they're just like me. He said, you don't know where they stand. And he went on to tell me some of the things that had happened with some of the folk in his congregation. And he's a biker. And he said to me, at least I know with my biker friends where I stand. Man. People, my heart broke. When I listened to, when I listened to this, we have been praying so hard for this family. To, and I know he has some responsibility here. But the church disappointed him. The church let him down. And I can imagine, I was... I was standing there. At first, I was, I was hot sore, and, and, and it turned to anger, and I was angry. I was fuming. You know, I could identify with Jesus. You know, when Jesus arrived at the temple, and he saw what they were doing with his church, and the way they were misrepresenting his church, and he sat down, and he plaited a whip, and he went in there, and he sorted them out. 
and I could identify with Jesus. I was so angry. If I knew which church it was, you guys might have had to come and bail me out because I was prepared to go in there and sort these people out. People, if it was just my family, I'd say that's fine. This is not an isolated incident. People are being hurt all over the place by other Christians. And it's got to stop. It's got to stop. This is not an isolated event. Not only is this happening in other churches, it happens here. Right here in Norwegian Settlers Church. We have stories. Folk who, who attend the church and stop coming to the church And we go and visit them and find out, what happened? Why don't you come to church anymore? Did we do something wrong? And I don't know how many times we've heard, no, it's because so-and-so is in your church. And -and so-and-so did a bad business deal with me. Or so-and-so did this. Or so-and-so did that. Basically, Christians behaving badly. People, we are ambassadors for Christ. And this needs to change. Let me see by way of a show of hands this morning. How many of you have been hurt or offended by another Christian? Okay. Honestly, okay, look around you, folk. It's not right. It's not right. If we are ambassadors for Christ, in other words, we are high-ranking officials of the kingdom of God, and we've been sent to this earth to represent what it's like to live in the kingdom of God, how are we doing? Based on the show of hands this morning, not so good, hey? Not so good. Now, I do realize that I'm generalizing and, I'm, and I do realize that there's a difference between just blatant, shocking behavior and the, and the little trip-ups and the little slip-ups that we make on a regular basis. I realize there's a scale of us not doing so well in our ambassadorship. But I'm convinced that all of us, every one of us here this morning, myself included, could become a better ambassador. What do you say? Every one of us could be better. No one has arrived there yet. So I'm painting the extreme, but we can all learn from this. I'm sure that you can remember the times when you didn't do as well as you knew you should have. So I don't need to convince you that there's a problem. The question is, what are we going to do about it? How do we respond to this? What do we need to do? Well, as you are probably well aware, this thing has been festering inside of me for for a couple of weeks now, for six to seven weeks. I've been pondering on this. I've been reading the scriptures. I've been praying and saying, Lord, what can we do? And I know there's probably a number of things that we can do. um, But I really believe that the Lord has, has given me two things that he wants me to focus on this morning. The first one is, if we're going to be good ambassadors of, of God, if, if we're going to do this job well, we need to understand, we need to have a clear understanding of two things. The first thing is, whom is it that we represent? Who are we actually representing? The full, total, clear picture of whom it is that we represent. Secondly, what does he expect from me? What does he expect from me? Not not what do other people expect from me. What does he expect from me? And that sounds simple. It sounds very simple, and you could probably give me some of those answers just off the cuff. But I'm not so sure that we have full clarity when it comes to to these two things. So I'm going to just expand on them a little bit. First of all, whom do we represent? Now, I've often referred to the Bible as a, a manual, an instruction manual, and this is how you live your life. Read the manual, and it'll help you. And, and that's true, but it's not completely true. 
The Bible is in fact a picture of God. The Bible is a picture of God. It's not a 2D picture, just a little snapshot of who God is. It's a detailed 3D picture that gives us insight into the depths and the intricacies of the character of God. Who is God? Read the Bible. It will tell you every aspect of who God is. So if you want to know who it is that you, you, that you are representing, if you want to get a, a true picture in your mind of God, then here's a few things, three things. Firstly, you have to read the whole Bible. You can't get a picture of God by just taking out a few random scriptures that you like, and now you've got a picture of God. You can't do that. They're often quoted out of context. You need to read the whole Bible. Have you said, I've said this a couple of times before, are you reading the Bible? The whole Bible. You need to do that intentionally and with a, with a, with a desire in your heart to want to, to get to know who this God is that you serve. The second thing is that you need to understand this is an ongoing process. Every time I pick up the Bible, I begin to discover things about God that I didn't know. Every time. So you're not going to get it in one sitting. You need to keep reading the Bible as much as you can, from cover to cover. Keep reading the Bible, and you will slowly begin to get a picture of who this God is that we are representing. And then thirdly, we need to resist the temptation to delete the stuff that we don't like. Have you heard of the app Photoshop? Do you know what it means to Photoshop a picture? Yes, no, yeah, I love Photoshop, because if you're unphotogenic like me, okay, and you look terrible in photos, Photoshop is, is amazing, because with Photoshop, you can take a picture and you can edit it. You can change the background, if there's not enough light, you can fix it, you can do all that kind of stuff. You can even make me look handsome. Trust me, you can. If you've got a double chin, psst, double chin's gone, okay. Photoshop is an amazing tool when used in the correct thing. But we do that with the Bible. We Photoshop the picture or the image that we have of God. We want to hear about God's love, His grace, His mercy, His compassion. And that's, and that's critical. That's important. We need to because that's a part of who He is. And so I'm not saying we, we don't need to focus on that. We do. It's very important. But we don't want to hear about the other stuff. And that's equally as important. We don't want to talk or hear about His justice. We don't want to hear about God's wrath. We don't want to hear about God's discipline. We don't want to hear that God is a jealous God who will deal severely with us if we don't put him first. We, we Photoshop that stuff out because it's uncomfortable. We want to rather hear about the, the consequences of his love and his grace, his rewards. But we're not so keen to hear about the consequences of our disobedience. So as a result, we get a distorted picture of who God is. We get a picture of a kind and loving God that will always be there and will always love us and will always protect us no matter what happens. And although that's true, that's only one aspect of who God is. And so when, when things happen in our lives and God steps out of the box or the picture that we've put him in, then we get disappointed. God, why are you doing this? We have a distorted picture of who God is. The funny thing is, and I, and I try to get this, the exact stats on this, but I wasn't able to get them in time. The funny thing is there are more scriptures that deal with the consequences of our disobedience than there are that deal with the consequences of our obedience. 
and the ratio is astronomical. It's probably in around about the 70 to 30 percent of scriptures that deal with what happens when we're disobedient as opposed to what happens when we're obedient. Let me give you an example of photoshopping. Listen to what the gods, God says through the prophet Jeremiah. I'm busy reading through the Old Testament, uh, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah. I've just finished uh, Jeremiah, and I'm in Ezekiel at the moment. And my eyes have been just opened again as, I read, as I've read the book of Jeremiah. I've got a number of scriptures which I'm going to read. They're on the back of your bulletin. They're actually printed on there, so you don't need to write them down. I want you to listen to what God says to the people through the prophet Jeremiah. A horrible and shocking thing, this is from Jeremiah chapter 5, a horrible and shocking thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy lies, the priests rule by their own authority, and my people love it this way. Isn't that true of today? There are many, many churches that are built and many, many TV ministries that are built on prophets telling people what they want to hear, and they're doing very well because my people love it this way. Jeremiah 14, this is what the Lord says about this people. They greatly love to wander. They do not restrain their feet. So the Lord does not accept them. He will now remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. Then the Lord said to me, do not pray for the well-being of this people. Although they fast, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not Accept them. Instead, I will destroy them with the sword, famine, and plague. And he continues, Jeremiah chapter 16. But you have behaved more wickedly than your fathers. See how each of you is following his own stubbornness of his evil heart instead of obeying me. So I will throw you out of this land into a land neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you will serve other gods day and night, for I will show you no favor. Jeremiah chapter 29 from verse 16. But this is what the Lord says about the king who sits on David's throne and all the people who remain in this city, your countrymen who did not go with you into exile. Now, if you know the story of Jeremiah, God told the people through Jeremiah that they were going to be going into exile in Babylon, and he said they needed to go. He instructed them to go. But a bunch of them went, and a bunch of them stayed. And so here God is addressing those who stayed, the disobedient ones who stayed. And he says, yes, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I will send the sword, famine, and plague against them. And I will make them like poor figs that are so bad they cannot be eaten. I will pursue them with the sword, famine, and plague, and will make them abhorrent, to all the kingdoms of the earth, and an object of cursing and horror, of scorn and reproach among all the nations where I drive them, for they have not listened to my words, declares the Lord, words that I sent them again and again by my servants, the prophets. And then he says, and you exiles have not listened either, declares the Lord. And then he starts from the exiles that did listen, but slipped up when they, when they went into exile and didn't obey the Lord. Now, people, I've given you just a very brief summary and a censored version of what is found. I'm taking one book in the Bible of what that book says about how God, God's approach to dealing with our sin and our lack of obedience to Him. Go and read it. Let's take that one book. The interesting thing for me was that if I had to ask you this morning to quote a scripture for me from Jeremiah. Anyone know a scripture from Jeremiah? Jeremiah 29 verse 11, is that right? Okay, what does it say? For a, we can probably all recite it, can't we? For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. One verse. There are counted them. 1,364 verses in Jeremiah. We quote one verse. What do we do with the other 1,363 verses? I'm sure they're not underlined in your Bible. 
I'm sure they're not highlighted, but they're relevant. If we want to live our lives as ambassadors of God, then we need to get the full picture of who it is that we're representing. We have a very limited photoshopped view of who this God is. And unfortunately, if we're honest, because of that, we live undisciplined and reckless lives when it comes to our faith and the things that we know we should be doing and the things that, we, that we're not doing. And I'm, I know this is true for me. There's a passage in Hebrews chapter 12 that says this, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so, worship God acceptably, with reverence, and with awe. For our God is a consuming fire. We've got to see that part of God that we don't like to talk about. So I'd encourage you to read the whole word. Okay. And as you read the word of God, ask God to reveal himself to you. To show you the areas of your life that he needs to speak into. What does God expect of us? The second point. A five-year-old girl was, was misbehaving in church um, on a Sunday morning. And she was getting up to mischief, and her father was just about to take her outside and apply the rod of discipline to the seat of her pants, and uh, he was about to correct her, um, her attitude and her, and her behavior. And so just before he does take her outside, he says to her, my girl, I'm going to take you outside, and, and do you know what you're going to get? And she looks up at him with his big brown eyes. And she says, the chocolate? <laughs> you see, sometimes our expectations and God's expectations are worlds apart. We're hoping for a chocolate. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave you to finish that story. Remember the opening scripture that we had, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 15, it was a call to ambassador, ambassadorship. Um, we are a new creation. We need to start living as if it were true. Folk, what is expected of us? There needs to be change. We can't continue to live the way that we used to live when we were not a Christian. There needs to be change. We are a new creation. We should be living our lives very very differently. How? Huh? Well, the scriptures are very, very clear. I'm going to read some scriptures for you just now, but I don't need to because the scriptures are very, very clear. There's a lot of stuff in the scripture which is unclear and we, don't, we can debate on. But how should we live? What we should do and what we shouldn't do? There are lists of them in the scriptures. Let me read a couple of them to you. Again, these are listed on the back of your bulletin, so you don't need to jot them down. I've got four scriptures I'm going to be reading. The first one is from Ephesians chapter 4, and it says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Ephesians chapter 4, a little bit later on. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. These are the expectations that the Bible has, that God has of us through the Bible. Ephesians 4 verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 
Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. You can go home and read these scriptures, and there are many, many more. And the most beautiful one for me is in Galatians chapter 5. It gives both sides of the coin. The acts of the sinful nation are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Stuff we should have to stop doing. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, this is the good stuff. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have, have crucified the sinful nature and its passions and its desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. And the list goes on. The Bible is very clear on how we should and we shouldn't live. And uh, this morning as I was just going through and just going through my sermon and um, preparing, I got a WhatsApp message. I'm part of a WhatsApp group um, with Chris and the men's prayer group, and there's another one, and it came through this morning. And I thought, wow, how appropriate was that? How confirmation was this passage? I'm going to read it to you. It came from Ecclesians. Eh, Ecclesians. It's a new book. Ecclesiastics 12, verse 13. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. What a way to end this this morning all has been heard folks we need to fear god we need to have a clear picture of who he is so that we can fear him and we need to keep his commandments we have to live our life in the way that he expects us to do now, i sincerely hope that the holy spirit has spoken to you as i've read through some of these passages um, and wherever you're at that the holy spirit would meet you there I'm going to end just by reading three verses, uh, more by verses of encouragement or verses as to the, what the Scripture says about our next steps. How do we respond to this? James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25 says, Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the Word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Hebrews 6, we want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. And then finally, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36 to 39. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and not delay. But my righteous will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back. He's talking about us, people. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. That's us this morning. We are those who believe and are saved. Let us not shrink back, but let us move forward. Not only has God made provision for our sins through the cross, 
Not only has he reconciled us to himself by washing away our sins and, and making us new, but he has also passed on the mantle or, or the responsibility of being true ambassadors for him. Do you accept that responsibility this morning? The responsibility of being an ambassador for God. You know, the amazing thing is that we don't have to do this on our own. He has sent His Holy Spirit to help us. He has sent His Holy Spirit. Jason preached on the Holy Spirit last week. The Holy Spirit is the one that, that comes in and empowers us, enables us to live the life that God expects of us. We can't do it on our own. Yes, there are things that we need to deal with. There are areas of our life that we need to be disciplined in. There are things that we need to sort out. James, uh, James says that resist the devil and he will flee. So there's stuff we have to do. But he also says submit to God. And so there's an aspect of us being able to come before the Holy Spirit and before the Lord this morning and say, Lord, I don't want to continue like this. This is not right. Help me to live my life in a way that will bring honor and glory to you. Help me to live my life in a way that will represent what the kingdom of God is all about. And so we're going we're gonna to fudge the end of the service today. Um, unfortunately, there's going to be no tea or coffee after the service. If you need to leave and you want to go home, um, that's great. Um, we just ask if you would leave quietly. Um, but Jason and the team are going to sing. come up just now. We're going to do a closing song. And after that, if you need to leave, um, we'd invite you. You're more than welcome to leave. But if you want to stay for a while after church and just do business with God, then we're going to create an opportunity for you to do that. Jason and the team will be singing a few more songs. And if you want to just sit in your pews, in your chairs, and just do business with God, ask God to, to minister to you, um, ask God to open your hearts to the things which He might want to speak to you through, then please do that. If you want to take a step of faith and come to the front and submit yourself to the Holy Spirit this morning, say, Holy Spirit, I need you. And I open myself anew and afresh to you to come in and minister, to come in and take over. Help me to live my life, to sort out the stuff that I need to sort out and to live my life in a way that would honor you. Then please feel free to do so. Pastors and the elders will be available. If you need somebody to pray with you, they'll be here to pray with you. But this is between you and God. There's nothing waiting for you at home. I hope, I would encourage you to stay and allow the Lord to minister to you this morning. Jason, would you and the team come up and we're going to sing our closing song before we do that. While you guys are coming up, I'm just going to pray. Heavenly Father, you have burdened my heart for a few months now, Lord Jesus, with regards to this issue of how we live our lives. The kingdom that we are meant to be representing, Lord, we're not doing such a good job of that. The church does not have a track record, a good track record. And this morning, as I've shared what I believe you've laid on my heart, I trust that through your Holy Spirit, you would impress that on each person's heart here this morning. Lord, those who are open to you doing business with them, I pray that you would do business with them. That as we, we're not rushing off, as we're committing ourselves to spend time in your presence, Father, I pray that you would do what only you can do. That you would empower us, you would encourage us, you would uplift us. Lord, to be a testimony out there 
of the kingdom of God. This should be a safe place, Lord, where people can come and be encouraged and loved and cared for. Help us to do that better, Lord. Every one of us has a responsibility in this area. So we just pray for that now, Lord Jesus. As we, as we sing this closing song, Lord, pray that we would sing these words from deep within us. We wouldn't just be mouthing them off, but we would be declaring our submission to you this morning. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.